Hello everyone, welcome back to OC Recovery's YouTube channel. Today I want to talk about some of the, the more common misconceptions in the recovery process. I'm going to talk about insight, I'm going to talk about other tools that people use. But before I go any further, if you could please subscribe down below. Always great stuff going up in the channel. Hopefully it won't all just be me by me soon, even though I will be making videos a lot. I'm trying to make at least a video a day. Um, we'll see how sustainable that is, but for now I'm having a good time doing it and we'll see how that goes. So. When we look at insight and how to stubbornly refuse to make yourself miserable about anything, yes, anything, Dr. Albert Ellis talks about the how insight basically doesn't lead anyone anywhere. And what we see is in the community for OC recovery and all other aspects in life is people put so much, so much of their recovery process on the insight itself. And the insight is the door opening. It's not anywhere out of the door. So what do we see all the time in life? And we're not just talking about OCD recovery. We're talking about addiction. We're talking about lifestyle changes, such as getting healthier, getting, uh, getting fit, exercising cardiovascular in a balanced way. People will read everything they can. Here's a great example. You can have someone who has a PhD in philosophy. They've gathered a tremendous amount of insight. Someone who has an MBA and master's in business and teaches at Harvard, but they've never actually opened a business. They have a PhD in philosophy, yet they're angry and resentful and, and have a ton of irrational beliefs. We see this. This is the majority of people because we believe that insight alone gets us where we want to go. And why is that? Insight is usually the easiest part of any change. It's very easy to sit on your couch and read a book, even when you're when you're suffering tr severely with OCD. You can still sit there and read in a more comfortable manner than you would if you were putting yourself in the exposure situation. So insight alone is only going to get you so far if anywhere at all. I know people who have read the books on the reading list. I know people in real life who educate themselves in their addictive personality issues and they never make any change. And we always hear stuff like people can never change. They are who they are. Well, actually they have a pretty good point. And the reason is because of the misconception on insight in itself. You can have a very good full awareness of the problem you have. You can educate yourself. You can get a PhD. You can get any other form of doctorate, uh, academia adv advancements and never make a change because the real change comes from looking at the belief system and the actual behavioral component. This cannot be overlooked because this is a lot of reason why a lot of the reason why people stay stuck. Let's use somatic OCD for an example. Well, I basically have come out the other side in a lot of ways. So I knew that I was afraid of my saliva. I knew the saliva wasn't the problem because I've always been salivating. I've always been breathing. I've always had a heartbeat. My bridge of my nose has always been there. All these other examples. But I knew that the fear and the avoidance behaviors was really what was keeping me stuck. But a lot of people are unwilling to make that change. And that is why they stay stuck. Because you can educate yourself as much as you want. So when I talk to people in the community, when I have one-to-ones with people, when I talk to people on the Facebook, the Instagram, and the YouTube, uh, and in the WhatsApp groups, I tell them, you know, you know, usually you know what you have to do. People know what they have to do. People don't do what's necessary for change. A couple reasons. It's much harder work to actually make the behavioral changes. It's not easy to go through the ups and downs of OCD recovery because it could be very, very anxiety riddled in a lot of ways. And humans love comfort. We've been sold on comfort. Comfort is a major trap. Uh, I see it everywhere. I see it with the optimal sleep. And the, we're going to talk about meditation and mindfulness. You know, you know that. Um, not fully against it, but in a lot of ways, I think it's used completely incorrectly. And people don't actually change using those techniques, which we see. So... People just don't want to go through the actual change process. It's not rocket science, okay? It, it, it's, it's very basically straightforward. Exposures, uncertainty, working on your fears, time, and patience. But we're looking for that easy shortcut. Maybe if I just educate myself enough on OCD. So you saw me talk about this in my Facebook post yesterday. We don't need to know about neuroplasticity and rewiring connections in the brain. We don't have to know about the thalamus and the limbic system and the connections between them. We don't have to know about no susceptive sensitization. We don't have to know about any of these neurological, physiologic processes, the chemical imbalance, the dopamine versus serotonin, norepinephrine and epinephrine. We don't have to know about any of that. First of all, that's for professionals. 
that work in the field to educate each other and really talk and doctor talk. So when people ask me, you know, if I was to go to someone and say, you have cervical spondylitic myelopathy, they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, your disc herniation is pressing onto your spinal cord. You know, we use the, the verbiage that you're seeing on Google and Yahoo and any other search engine is for providers. It's not for doctors to use with patients. That is a fact because it confuses people. It makes you think you have to know more than you actually need to know. All you need to know is understand OCD, understand why relapses and setbacks happen, backdoor spikes, the fear and the anxiety cycle, and then move forward with the tools. Now, let's talk about mindfulness and meditation. I was listening to someone yesterday, and I just listened to it again when I was on my talk, because I did want to talk about it. Talking about how he uses mindfulness in situations of, uh, of despair. He uses meditation in high moments of anxiety. All you're doing is using a tool to escape the way you're feeling, OCD or not. Now, I'm not talking about the potential benefits physiologically and, and, uh, and your anatomy and your neurophysiology with meditation and calm and being present in the moment. All vital, not, you know, if you never did them, you, would, you could completely live a non-anxiety, non-chronic depression, shame, guilt, and OCD-free life. You'll still have the genetic component more than likely, but you won't suffer anymore. And you can never use mindfulness and meditation. Mindfulness and meditation is a very, very, <laughs> um, I don't want to say cheap, but a very easy way to escape the problems that you're having. I'm not saying it can't be beneficial. I choose not to use it because when I use it, I'm trying to escape the moment. I know Oliver likes to use it. I know other people like to use it. Awesome. But it will not solve your problems. It's insight and insight alone. Even if you're doing a body scan, you're still being aware of your breathing. Oh man, I'm really stressed out today because, you know, uh, I got into a fight with my partner, for an example, blah, blah, blah. Let me go meditate. That meditate provide, meditation and mindfulness provides you with no framework to work on your problems. This needs to be covered because it is misconstrued and misunderstood by almost every single meditation expert there is out there. If you meditate and you want to be mindful, awesome. If you're purposely searching for mindfulness in every single moment, and you, have an o and you have OCD, you're probably using it as a compulsion. And it's really problematic for certain fears like somatic OCD. I don't, I never practice mindfulness. This doesn't mean I wasn't present in the moment, but sometimes you'll be present in the moment and sometimes you won't be present in the moment. That's just the way it is. Like right now I have background anxiety. It's there, I'm mindful of it, but I'm not forcefully trying to search for mindfulness. I don't think meditation is beneficial for most people. And I'm going to tell you why. It's a drastic statement. I have to say again, it's not, it's not beneficial in the way that people want it to. But I know plenty of people who meditate I know plenty of people who practice mindfulness and they never change because they never work on the belief system that's present at the current moment. This is huge and so misunderstood in all the literature about mindfulness and meditation. I get you don't understand mindfulness and meditation. You don't understand those topics. I understand them well enough to know that people use them as an escape tool and that's all I need to know. Now, this doesn't mean it's not going to benefit you. As I said now four times, it can, but it cannot be the problem primary mode of turning down the fear cycle because it provides no framework like thoughts or thoughts. Another major misconception about OCD recovery. How do I want to say this? A lot of people don't quite understand acceptance. You can have a PhD, you could be a therapist, a psychologist, or a psychiatrist and have training in RABT and CBT and ACT and logotherapy and all these other forms. But if you don't put them in the practice, it's, it's useless. It's, it's, it's a useless endeavor, and I'm going to tell you why. In order to... Acceptance is something that you feel. It is a surrender. It is a belief system that has to take place. It's not a tool. That's the problem why it doesn't stick with people. We're using it as tools. It's not a tool. It is a method of seeing life in a rational manner. That is the missing component. Everyone that I see that bashes it or talk to me, I don't quite get it. How do I make it stick? There is no making it stick. And the longer you think like that, the further it's going to elude you. It's something you have to feel right now. Working with Rob for about 16 months, made tremendous progress with somatic OCD. My body dysmorphic and other fitness irrational beliefs have surfaced because they were still dormant. A lot of people get stuck on this, think they're recovered, underlying fears pop up. That's why the journey is not as simple as many will think.
There's usually not one particular fear if you have chronic OCD. Right now I have background anxiety majority of the day, back again like it was in the beginning of somatic OCD. Had about a seven month stretch, stretch where I wasn't anxious. Now I'm back to chronically anxious for the last probably 12 weeks, but none of that matters. I let it be there. I work on it, I have some bad moments. I have some good moments and I try to live my life as best as I can. Still do business meetings, still run a company, still hang out, still do my videos, still go hiking. I do things, go get my teeth cleaned, floss, which my wife yells at me because I don't do. And I could do all these things anxious. That is acceptance. It's not sitting there brushing my teeth thinking, oh my gosh, I can accept this right now. I can accept this anxiety. You're forcing it. We've all done that. We've all are going to do that. So acceptance isn't a doing, it is a being, as Rob said, and that's super important. But the main thing I wanted to make this video about was because of the insight. I'm going to be doing a video tomorrow, cannot wait to do it, on chapter eight in Paul David's At Last of Life on intrusive thoughts. The carryover from GAD to OCD and the major differences talking about your fears, your anxiety doesn't mean anything's real and how that doesn't actually unlock the chronic OCD cycle and you do have to accept the worst case scenario for a lot of people. It's a really cool topic. It's one of my favorite chapters in the book but about 50% of it arbitrarily doesn't actually work with OCD. And it's hard to see that when you don't have OCD because your brain can always say, what if I'm the 1%? No, I don't deserve to be let off the hook. No, no. And that actually has a strong amount of validity since we see this anecdotally time and time and time again. But again, got to read, got to get the insight. The insight opens the door. That's all it does. You could sit there at the door and just stare out and never make any change. We see it in every walk of life addictions, poor behaviors, easy way out, comfort, short-term gain with monetary stock market, uh, OCD recovery, everything you can imagine, all the insight without the patience, the ups and downs, the understanding is enough, but you got to move forward and live your life. You got to make the behavioral changes. I just was talking to my buddy about this today. We both struggle with the same type of addiction and we talk about it. We got to make the change. Same thing with OCD recovery. You got to make the behavioral change. Albert, I'll stay with this. Albert Ellis said in the book, there are many people that actually don't need to work on their beliefs that much and can make drastic change by working on their behavioral component. But we know with OCD, a lot of people have to look at that core fear in a non-compulsive manner, which we talk about constantly. And that's that. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day. And don't forget to subscribe. I always forget to say that at the end and then I get yelled at. They don't yell at me, but they're like, you know, you know how it goes. But um, thank you so much and I'll see you tomorrow.